try to forget Maybe it's time to accept Maybe it's not about perfect ending Maybe it's about the story Okay, we are back. Roman Anton Podcast Studio. I think it's number 46, Frank. I'm just going to guess. And we have Nemo. I'm just going to call you Nemo, and I'm going to put on the slide Nemo unless you'd like to use both names. But it seems like you're, and you don't have any social media, really. It seems like the stuff's written about you are Nemo. Um, Yes, sir. Nemo it is. Welcome to town, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we haven't known each each other that long, but... um, it seems like 2024 was the year you took a slightly different direction. Yeah, definitely. I think retiring would be a different direction. <laughs> okay. yeah. Just didn't want to put that word in your, <laughs> on the tape. Until. I love that word. I highly recommend retiring. Right. It's great. Good. Well, we'll work our way backwards to that then, if you don't mind, because sure. you retired here. You, you, you retired and then you came here, but you're not retiring here as far as I can tell, but you're spending time here. So we are in, in Bangkok, Thailand, as we always are. Um, Nemo, uh, origins of the name, is there a history to that or parents give that name to you or someone else or, uh, mm-hmm. in the basket floating down the river, was that the name tag they put on your <laughs> basket floating down the river? <laughs> I like that story. reference. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got that Christian background. So I was at a Christian college, right? Calvin university oh. used to be called Calvin college. Calvin college. And I remember going to freshman orientation walk on the bus. This is international orientation. Okay. There were a bunch of, uh, it's like half of the population is Korean. Mm. Um, I guess a lot of Koreans like to go to American schools, which is great. And uh, some of the nice Korean ladies there just could not pronounce my name to save their lives. They just couldn't do it. And so one of them declared, you are Nemo uh. on the bus. I'm like, okay, all right, it's fine. I'm Nemo. And this is around the time of Finding Nemo. Right. Said, hey, I haven't seen the movie, but... Seems pretty popular. I'll take it. And Hmm. from then on out, Nemo it was. So I think I didn't do research on this point before, but I had a similar um, cinematic reference. I think, gosh, I want to say Jeff Bridges' father um, played Captain Nemo in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. (laughs) Any connection to that? Or is Nemo, is, I think Nemo might, be related back to that okay so the only two nemos i know were that and so uh, the korean one was she's working at the school and she gave you the nickname she was a fellow student fellow student i see okay mm-hmm. and that stuck it stuck huh and looking back it actually worked pretty well because nemo is a whole lot easier to google <laughs> than my real name okay we <laughs> want to ask <laughs> yeah <laughs> good so that was uh, uh you said in college yeah and so international, so 50-50, 30-70, 80-20, what were the numbers, uh, meaning the, the constituency sh- should be American because it's in America? Oh, yeah. At that school, it was basically like 90% Dutch. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Coming yeah. in. Yeah, I did not know that until I walked in. I saw just <laughs> blonde hair, blue-eyed, tall people Oops. everywhere. Uh, and I'm like, what is going on here? Turns out there's a Dutch population. And was it Ann Arbor? No. Uh, Grand Rapids. Grand Michigan. Rapids, right, right. Grand Rapids. Yeah. And they're, I mean, they're, they're wonderful people. I was uh, basically like adopted into the Dutch community. All right. My last name became Vander Chusma. <laughs> okay, just, just because of all the Vanders out there. I could play uh, Dutch bingo with the best of them. Hmm. Everyone's like second cousins of someone and third cousins. You uh, have to be careful dating. All right. Out there if you're Dutch. Because you never know if the lady you just met could be related to you. So was the school uh, driving the Dutch or was the town? I think it was the town. Hmm. Yeah. And really 90%-ish or a lot? 90%-ish. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so uh, a religious school though, right? Uh, so Definitely. we started with that. Yeah. And yeah. is I, I remember there being a Calvin and a Reformation and that's about it. And that yeah. was 1,400. Couldn't be 1,400. 1,500 or 1,600s? Yeah, those are the origins of um, the whole 
theological background of the school <laughs> and just how they thought about things. Yeah. Right. Okay. Because you'd mentioned this before, and I wasn't sure I heard that right. So yeah, good um, memory. that was, well, that was a, a, a college choice supported by your parents, or did you do that on your own? Yeah. My, my dad uh, at the time was a pastor. Hmm. So I grew up in a Christian household. Okay. Right. Pretty conservative as well, actually. Yeah. Um, I've, I've since become far less conservative, thankfully. Um, but uh, at the time, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to go to university. Right? Not everyone does. So my, my dad was uh, quick to recommend, and I, I welcomed his recommendation. He was quick to recommend a variety of Christian schools. Mm. I went to Christian high schools growing up, went to like a Christian primary school growing up in Canada. So Christian schools almost throughout my whole life. So he recommended a few, and I had my top choice. And then it, at the end of the day, it was just whichever one gave us the most money, gave me the most money. Right. Because I did not come from money at all. Pastors don't make okay. a good amount of money. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so um, can I ask, so this is um, Christian, this is Calvin Protestant, right? Correct, yeah. And so you were born in Canada by all of that, I can summarize? I was born in uh, San Francisco Bay Area, okay. o- Oakland specifically. Okay, then yeah. dad as a pastor moved up to Canada during your lifetime? Yep, that's right. And you dad. went with him? That's right. Okay. Dad moved all over and I went with him. Where in Canada? Uh, Toronto at first. Oh, nice. And then later it was Medicine Hat in the province of Alberta. This is it. Right. So uh, (laughs) (laughs) Medicine Hat. We met, um, well, we just met uh, some folks from Medicine Hat at at Queen Bee of all places. So That was wild. Yeah. So the the circular economy. But um, so dad went there, mom went there, you went there, brother or sister? No brother, no sister. Okay, so Just easy me. easy move, three people maybe, unless you have a bunch of stuff. I assume your your dad had taken some vow of uh, not uh, poverty or whatever they call that in Christianity, but wasn't lugging yeah, we, synthesizers. We, we, were not, <laughs> we were not rich. Okay. <laughs> no. All right, were you um, into basketball at that early age when you moved up to Medicine Hat? Yeah, I was actually. I have very fond memories of YMCA, yeah. playing basketball as a kid. Um, throwing a behind the back pass when I was like grade one. Uh oh. Yeah. And uh, in a live game, I didn't know what I was doing, mm-hmm. but uh, winning like little medals for mm. just, you know just the simplest drills. But it, it was a really good experience. You know, looking back, that yeah. they encouraged the joy of the game. Yeah. And I think that really pulls you through. If you enjoy it, it doesn't feel like work. And then later on, as you get older, you know the training and all the work that goes into it, you know, it doesn't feel like a grind. Yeah. Right? So let's break this down a little bit. Let's focus family second, of course. Let's look at basketball first. Was this, was your basketball education started in San Francisco? My basketball education? Yeah. Mm, good, good, good word. My basketball education, yeah, I would say probably got, I was probably more like Hong Kong high school. Okay. Yeah, because I played high school basketball in Hong Kong. And then later in my like mid twenties, I was in San Francisco, and I I picked up basketball again at that point because yeah. my college years I did not play at all. all right. And then post college, I didn't really play. It was really my mid twenties I started picking up the game again. Did you like when you were, uh, I guess we'd call it in America kindergarten? Um, did you like watching basketball then? Yeah, grade school. Yeah, I remember I have good memories watching games with my dad. Uh, although it would have been probably like grade four five mm, okay. onward where you know we're in hong kong at the time so you have to wake up at some ungodly hour right. to catch live nba games West so Coast i was watching sure, i was yeah. watching jordan right yeah yeah that was my era right uh, post post magic post larry bird so chris mullen for golden state yeah uh, mitch richmond those guys run tmc or whatever that was yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. huh interesting and so you had uh, uh were you a collector of things Basketball cards, shoes. Uh. Nah, not not really. I was given some some uh, hockey cards in Canada. Okay. I still have a whole <laughs> okay. bunch of them. Any Might be worth something? Any notables? Uh, I mean, I got some good cards on there. I got, but I it's, Gretzky. It's been so long. Yeah, I had plenty of Gretzky cards for uh. sure. Um, yeah, they're they're sitting in in storage, nicely protected. That's interesting. I read something where he does. Was it him who doesn't sign memorabilia? I think there's only one. Sign Gretzky card. It's like the Honus Wagner of wow. cards. Yeah. 
One signed Gretzky card. Yeah, I, I may be making this up, but this might be some point check on the ride to the next stop. But We'll just say it is. Yeah, I, I like that. Right. I think he came up with the idea that he wanted to have the ultimate collectible early in his career. That's pretty cool. Right. It's sort of, on the one hand, it's like, who do you think you are? But on the other hand, if you pull it off and you're the great one and there's one card. Gretzky was incredible. $50 million card or something like that. Oh, I can only imagine. Right. Some, some. Mining and minerals guy in Canada says, I want the great one card. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, right. Uh, okay, well, cool. So, wow. So, you've moved in just simple questions. You've moved um, to three locations, Canada, Medicine Hat, Toronto, uh, and then Hong Kong. And we really didn't even nail down the specifics. And were those all father, mother uh, moves for, what is that called when they do that? Is that, is that just taking on parishes or is it? spreading changing. the word or is it advancing the cause or changing jobs huh. yeah changing jobs different churches and then later at um kind of like the denominational headquarters in a research role just changing jobs and my dad dad changed jobs more than a few times and also early on he was quite the academic so he mm. he liked to study at different schools different universities and he would actually uh go to universities solely to study under certain professors interesting during his um master's yeah during his master's journey he has like multiple masters you know i'm really proud of my dad actually if he's if he's watching this later on he got his phd in his 60s wow <clears throat> it was his dream mm. and he um yeah he's just in, in what his 60s D he, divinity or yeah yeah okay yeah he just thought you know what i'm gonna do it from where can i ask uh it was some kind of like I think it's some kind of Chinese okay. theological seminary nice. or Hong Kong one, something like that. Yeah. Uh, but, but, uh, uh, years and he had to have a dissertation and present it and pass it. And yeah, probably well, not the easiest thing to do when you're running a large parish or multiple large parishes and moving around, keeping your books together, <laughs> keeping your studies going. Yeah. 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 So interesting. Um, and so, uh, Boy, how does that work? So when you're a kid and he sits and says, son, you're going to grow up one day and go to the army and protect the country and get an advanced degree and stay in Medicine Hat or San Francisco the rest of your life. Or was it, son, life's an adventure. I don't know where you're going to go. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're going to do, but have fun. Or was it something in between? Or was it not that calculated? I don't think it was that calculated i think it was more of a do whatever you want to do mm. on my on my dad's side just do whatever you want to do we love you we support you do you whatever know. you want to do rock and roll or do whatever you want to do good peaceful harmonious stuff because if i look at the mandate on your website www.something.com um it says without cheating um Businesses that do good or, yeah, I think that was the first one. And then I got to cheat. You wrote down two things. Good for the planet. Good for the business. Okay. So good for the planet. So was that his underlying premise or was there no such premise? You could be the mauler for the front line of the World Wrestling Federation and he'd say good, good choice. <laughs> I think I think there was always these you know underlying religious principles mm. that he would expect out of me. Yeah. Um, uh, but these principles are really general. You know, there, there's stuff in like almost every religion. Sure. You know, like treat other people well, right. things of that nature. And so, um, other than that, yeah, it was it was wide open. Like at one point, I remember in college, I was probably telling my dad like, "Hey, I'm gonna pursue music, like really right. pursue it, like play drums and right. played a lot of my life. Like, let me." try to be a pro drummer right and he's like, all right you know, <laughs> okay is yeah i mean i you could i guess i could the when you do that gesture with that i could gesture it as open and accepting or dismissive like yeah okay guy you, you accepting. yeah all right yeah open and accepting for sure because if the week before you said fireman and the week after you said nasa pilot then it's just sort of whimsical and you're like oh okay son yeah <laughs> whatever you say this week yeah. but it was sort of more like Right. Rock, rock and roll. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. And mm. that's what it felt like to me. That's how I read it. Right. Right. I think probably that's probably what matters is how I read it at the end of the day. Right. Do you think you were right? 
do I think I was right in how I read it? Yeah, looking back. Yeah. Okay, so he lines up with the image you had at the time when he said it, and yeah. you look back and say I wasn't wrong because he was actually pushing pushing me towards the Bible in the corner when he said that. But uh, there was a drum set, and he's saying, "Yeah, play drums, but push me towards the Bible." Yeah, there was never the uh, mm. the, the East Asian stereotypical parental mm. expectation of you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that's how I just sounded. So I wasn't uh, uh, intending to sound like that, but that did, could, could, could have come off that way. So I, I didn't mean it that way because I think probably my parents had that as well, but never really said it and were absolutely mystified when I was able to finish higher learning because I don't think I was the one in the family they were hoping was going to do that or expecting to do that. So, uh, yeah, I got my degrees. I'm not sure what they ever ended up helping me with. But um, okay, so that's interesting. So sort of guidance, soft touch, uh, core tenets of religion and the five pillars of, of Calvinism or whatever they call that in the reform. Um, and you're off and you go and is the first thing you see in these towns, the new office for dad? Here's where I work, son. Or was it, no. did you, were you expected to be there on Sunday if that's when the proceedings were for him? No, did no. You, no, when I was in, uh, you know, as I got older, uh, you know, one of the nice things about growing up in Hong Kong is that, um, you know, in the, in the U.S., right, mm. kids don't really start to experience freedom until they're of the age where you can drive a car. 16 in America. Exactly, right? Yeah, I, if I, you're lucky enough to even have a car right, that you can drive. Right, right, right. I concur with that. Or you have friends who do, and so you co-opt. Exactly. And yeah. before that time, you're kind of stuck. You're kind of homebound unless you take the bus or the train. If you're in a city that has buses and trains, right. keep that in mind too, right? right? But when you're growing up in Hong Kong, right, mass transit is everywhere. You've got mm. little kids jumping on the bus by themselves, going yeah. to wherever they need to go, such as to school or after school programs. So growing up there in Hong Kong, mm. I mean, I really got to have freedom mm. and my parents allowed that. So my mom and dad would be at a Chinese speaking church my dad's church yeah and my chinese my cantonese was not that strong right because i grew up in canada right so i would go to english-speaking churches elsewhere with my friends so we went to different churches growing up interesting and it was fine did you skip or did you go i went yeah i, I enjoyed the church life and i got really deep into it. i played drums for a lot of youth related church stuff too frank do you drum for your church do you drum at your church on sundays well you play everything right there we go. I, See, are, are you Filipino? There we go. <laughs> yes. You play everything. Yeah, there we go. Okay. I'm jealous. Uh, at the church and bass and guitar. And sing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> What's your favorite song? Turn up your mic. We can't. <laughs> are you not going to do it? So did you have a song you liked? And was it in, in church? Yeah, was it multi denominational? Not denominational. Multi. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, so be not afraid. Yeah, there's, there's a variety of like hits, you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. pop hits for church. Go Forth Among the People. Did you have that one? I, I don't know that one. Okay. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> we'll, we'll have to try it. Check it out. In the car, we'll check it out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, I, we, would, we would play, you know, all the usual hits to the point where we get tired of playing yeah, the yeah. hits. Um, and then we try to remake the hits or like, you know, rearrange the hits for our own style, right. so on and so forth. It, it was, you know, we got to enjoy mm. the mm. process as well. And also, I have to say, Shout out to a lot of my, my bandmates from that time who I'm still in touch with. Like, we actually played pretty well. Like, I was looking back, we had a pretty good squad. People were pretty talented, and we had a lot of fun. Um, it was a really good experience looking back. Really yeah. good. I, don't, I think a lot of kids growing up would not have gotten, you know, that kind of musical experience growing up. Right, especially connected not with someone's basement or living room, but a church setting. So it's yeah, a public setting, public right. stage, yeah. playing in front of hundreds, if not like over a thousand people, you right. know, there's a pressure to that when you're a kid. Uh, okay. Yeah. There's a lot in this. So I think I saw, um, so I mentioned your face, Facebook, uh, your social media is pretty meager and it generally is responding. It's rarely initiating. So I noticed one of the initiated posts you had was to your old bandmates. Yeah. And I think that was in Hong Kong. Right? Yeah. Okay. So Hong Kong was the entirety of high school, 14 yeah. to 18-ish? Yep. And then the 1 through 12 were in Canada, or was that in Hong Kong as well? Uh, 1 through 12? I uh, think grade 1 through grade yeah, yeah, 12? Yeah, 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 the way we'd call it in, in 
Yeah, so it was uh, grade one and two Canada, grade uh, three and four in Medicine Hat, also Canada, yeah, then yeah. five through 12 in Hong Kong. Okay, so you did the the impactful learning years were in Hong Kong. And yeah, yeah, formative. What was, so that was that um, one school the whole time or did you have to switch? Okay. One school. And um, was that near your dad's office, the church? Uh, near your church? Near my church, yeah. yeah. Like a block away from my church, actually. And so you'd really, in fifth grade or sixth grade as a kid, commute on your own? Yeah. With other kids? Oh, wait, fifth and sixth grade school bus. But mm. later on, I think, oh, I forgot when, maybe like eight, nine. It was bus, one bus, walk. Young. I think so, yeah. 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 And hot in the summer, cold in the winter, and all the stuff that goes along with it, living in the city. <laughs> yeah. Cold. Yeah, yeah. Hong Kong version of cold. Yeah, you know, jackets and backpack yeah. and maybe gloves or something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So a city kid. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. And so um, after Hong Kong, um, or after graduating high school, mm -hmm. um, do you go straight to Calvin? I do. In Michigan? And boy, was I happy. So you applied for schools uniquely in the U.S., or did you go up, apply around the world? Uniquely U.S. Mm. Yeah, well, I want to get out. So and you're a uh, U.S. citizen? Yeah. Born there? Okay. Parents are not? No. Okay. Uh, naturalized or? Naturalized drinker? in Canada. Okay. Okay. So you had that thing going on, and so you applied as a U.S. citizen, but you were overseas, so they didn't really know what to make you probably with those addresses. And you got into the school and you got a ride of some sort. And yep. you, you got there and you realized you were uh, 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 unique along with the rest of the student body. <laughs> and that they weren't exactly working in town. <laughs> they were coming around. Okay, well, cool. And so did you know what you're going to study? Yeah, I did. Uh, religion and communications. Wow. Religion first. Yeah, it was a double major at the time, but in order for me to get out of, in order for me to get out of my undergraduate program, and I think it took me six years, I had to reduce my religion major down to a minor. Right. So it, was a, it became a major minor, communications major, religion minor. But I was really there for the religion program. Right. And so I would assume Calvin College or whatever you said, it changed its name. If that's not it, I apologize. But um, that school um, was designed to have a, a, a religious major. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Other schools in America known for that? So like yeah. Oral Roberts University is one. Um, are there, like Marquette is Jesuit. Um, Boston College, I think, is a Jesuit school or maybe not. There, are those schools, do they have a theology degree? Was that is that well known amongst folks who are studying to get degrees in religion? Yeah, there are definitely some mm. schools that are, you know, more well known in religious circles. Yeah. yeah. And so yours was uh, a, a known religious degree. You were going for it, but you said, I want this other thing. Why did you want that other degree along with it? What, where did that come from? Communications, where did that come from? Actually, I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember, but <laughs> the communications degree made me a lot of money. That's right. for sure. <laughs> right. I, I said, sort of where I'm pulling this, I'm sled dogging this thing up the hill, and I don't want to put my notions of why based on what little I know. So I want to see when the break starts to happen or if it, it was always there or if there was no break and it was just religion marketing or marketing religion could have been either order. You know, communications, now that I think about it, I think I had a natural interest towards um, multimedia mm. at the time, whether it's audio production, video production, uh, because, I mean, imagine, right? You're, you're growing up playing music. If you're growing up playing music and you're somewhat nerdy about it you're right. going to learn av yeah you just kind of have to and so if you learn av then um it it goes into other realms like video live video feeds and whatnot and so all that technical stuff was pretty interesting to be hands-on with and i think that you know when you look at university what do you become a film major which is under communications at my school right right we're not mm. at usc here where you have like its own dedicated film program right but it's under the communications umbrella and so I, I think now that I look now that I look back, I haven't reflected on this in forever. I think that's what pulled me towards communications because it had, it was this like broad umbrella department that had a lot right. of my interests rolled into it. Right, that's funny, right? Yeah, it's funny how that works. Yeah, right. And and at the time, it was probably cutting edge new stuff that was 
replacing the cutting edge old new stuff that was still a generation shy of what we're seeing now and it's ease and sophistication and complexity at the same time with the ease right so yeah yeah so you come in and i think that's one area where for sure if you paid attention in grade school and high school you and and were playing frequently then you had an advantage Right. Sure. Yeah, you yeah. knew this stuff. Oh, yeah, that's no good. Comfortable. Yeah, right. That's good stuff. We use that. We know how to do that. And you sort of step in and you're already a practitioner. Yeah. And they're teaching you 101 level stuff. You're like, well, all right, I sort of know how to do this. So I'm actually at a graduate level and I'm just starting, right? It's sort of a funny duality there if yeah. you were skilled at something. That's yeah, why it was fun. It was fun. Huh. And so you're in school. So six years because you were fooling around and playing rock and roll, or six years because you were. Uh, praying late and missing classes and, and, and you had to make up courses because you were so devout or what was the reason for the six or is there no reason for the six? Yeah, there is a reason for the six. <laughs> it's because I started working. Ah, okay. I started working really, really early uh, in, in university. Yeah. Uh, I almost dropped out at one point. Because interesting. I, I was just thinking, hey, maybe I should just work full time and not even finish this degree. Yeah. And so... Um, S.L. Robbins and Associates, and then the the next mm-hmm. posting. Yeah, Blue um, Fire after that. Right, where in my mind, if I look, if I followed your CV at all, it, there's overlap. And so you're like, huh, okay. So junior year, he got a job offer or he started his own company or, you know, it, it starts to be unclear, but you were, you were uh, economically driven or board with school and you thought oh, I can I, I'm not I, I got I got four o'clock to ten o'clock available I can fill it with something that uh, w- what's the thought process because you're st- either way you're still a young man at that point right yeah. and so the, these aren't necessarily even if you're broke and you're working in the, the cafeteria it's still to commit a 30 hour second week after your 40 hour first week of education is yeah, you you don't take that on lightly, right? It's it's a grind. Yeah, it was it was definitely a grind. Yeah. And um th- there's a story behind it for sure. It was that a uh, freshman year of college, that first Christmas, I went back to Hong Kong to visit mom and dad. Mm. And it was during that time that my dad went deaf completely. Wow. Uh, it's kind of hard to be a pastor when you can't hear. I would guess. Right? Yeah. And so his hearing, and th- I mean, his hearing was such that over the years it had been declining and declining and declining and he was on hearing aids. No one could ever figure out why mm-hmm. his hearing was declining like that. And he still had some hearing, but that, that Christmas when I was there, I remember his hearing went, com- like it just overnight disappeared. Mm. And it was very traumatic experience, very jarring. I mean, I, I have vivid memories of you know, getting a phone call from my mom while I'm at youth group, the youth group that I had co-founded in Hong Kong. And she's like, she just told me in Cantonese, Mo Zaida, which is basically, it's all gone. Wow. And right away, I knew what that meant, uh, yeah. right? I didn't, there was no context. It was just a phone call, Mo Zaida, and I knew exactly what it meant. Huh. I remember going home and had like a, uh, a friend, uh, a mentee of mine that was in my neighbor. And I went home and he came with me. He knew, right? I told him, I'm like, oh man, I... This is, this is, I I don't even know. I can't put words to this. And he was so, so kind. Uh, Joseph Rigodon, this is for you. Uh, He was so, so kind. He came with me and I walked into the house and I saw my dad's shell shock face. You know, when someone's talking on the phone and they're in a public space and they're talking way too loud on the phone because they just don't, they can't. That was my dad talking to me. Mm. He was talking way too loud. And I knew I'm like, okay, he can't calibrate his voice. And um, Joe was with me, uh, neighbor, uh, and it uh, turns out Joe's uh, mom and dad are also very religious. In fact, his dad was a pastor. I, mm-hmm. I believe he was a pastor. Uh, but anyway, um, he called his parents and they came over to pray for my dad. This is at like midnight, you know, right. this is late. Right. They, they, they were in like their pajamas, right? <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. But yeah. and, they, and they, no, it's okay. And they came and they prayed for my dad. Uh, we all held hands together. They, they, had, they didn't know my dad, didn't know my mom. The only bridge here was me and Joe. Right, right. right. So we've got this kind of like shared experience for life. Um, and in, incredibly enough, the next day, my dad got a little bit of hearing back, mm. a little bit, which was a big deal because there's a big deal difference between nothing and something that you can amplify with a hearing aid, right? So um, 
<laughs> and and just to like kind of close the story off, or there's a reason for all this, right? Um, uh, last year, I was in the Philippines, and I hadn't seen Joe in forever. Uh-huh. But I went over and I visited him uh, in, in Manila, in the Philippines. And it was so good to see him. And more importantly, it was so good to see his mom because I was able to, at that point, really tell her how much it meant to me right, right. that she was there for me and my family at that time. Unfortunately, the father had passed away. Right. So I couldn't really send that along. But it, it was a very touching moment just to be able to like spend that time with, with his mom. Yeah. It was you know, getting older and older. But make a long story short, this made me realize that I'm probably the person making the money for the house now yeah. for my mom and dad, right? Like, what, what's my dad going to do? I, how can he be a pastor with no hearing? So at 18, freshman year, I, the, the drive to not just position myself as a top graduate right. to get a great job, <laughs> right? the drive which, was just different. Right? Which is the standard goal, which is the standard laudable, commendable goal if you go into a university and sure. you've got your sights set, I guess. Yeah, right. yeah. And I'm thinking like, okay, if, if I'm going to go for a great paying job at the end of college, if I can even finish college, I don't know how much time I got here, right? Um, just having good grades is probably not good enough. Yeah. So that was when I started. I started a company in college with a friend. Um to, to really uh, gain the experience and uh, apply some of the learnings that I had from some business books that I had read at the time. And then I started working at um, Dr. Steve Robbins Consultancy early on. And then later on, I joined a startup. And that was also why I, at one point I almost dropped out of school because I was thinking, hey, look, I've, I can work already. Yeah. I, do I need to finish my degree when I can just work full time, build a career and then you know, pocket money to also send back home if needed? My parents never asked for money. Right. But I just kind of knew in the back of my mind, like yeah. I might need to do this. Good son. Yeah. So what was so was what were your colleagues or your friends saying? Yeah, it was because I feel like if I took the temperature of the community right now on getting the degree or not, um, there's a significant amount of ambivalence now that didn't exist when I was going to school about if you have a chance to get the degree, whether or not you get it. So I guess that's a long way of saying people seem less attracted to a four or eight year degree than in the past, but that just may be that I'm meeting different people or different families. I don't know, but were your folks, were you, your guys and were the dudes or the people you're hanging out with um, saying, hey, quit, dude, just quit work. Your, your work is working out, quit, don't get the degree. Or was there no pressure like that to take the road less traveled? No, I had a pretty close circle in college. And so I, I only shared my thoughts with maybe one or two people. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm still in touch with them, some of my best friends. And um, no, they, they, didn't really, they didn't really push me any which way mm. or advise me any which way, but I think they just listened to me, right? So you had said something about your dad traveling to see um, uh, teachers or study with teachers that yeah. were influential. So... I'm sure there there are relevant names that I may or may not know, but um, he pursued his mentors or soon to be mentors, right? Um, and you just mentioned a doctor's name that you went to work for. Yeah, Doctor Steve Robbins, great yeah. guy. And so, um, and for some reason on your on your uh, LinkedIn, which you have, um, you mentioned names. Um, was he an instructor in the school as well, or was he just in the community? <laughs> he was uh, a gentleman in the community. It was wild how I even, it's funny how these things work, you know. You, you don't write a resume to apply for a job. Sometimes opportunities just kind of pop yeah, up yeah. and right. you got to be ready to seize it, right? And yep. I was ready to seize it at the time. But I tell you what, we were just sharing a stage at a, some random church where I was invited to play drums and he was a guy singing. <laughs> right. And we're the only two like East Asian guys on stage. So while we're rehearsing, I'm like, who are you? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, right. And he and he's yeah. very, you know, very friendly. He's a public speaker. Right, so right. professional public speaker, keynote speaker, one of the best in the business. And I mean that. Yeah. And so, you know, easy to get along with. It turns out a few things. He he graduated from the same school that I'm at, mm. Calvin. So he's yeah, a Calvin yeah. grad. Okay. Um, he DJed when he was at Calvin. At the time, I was also DJing for fun, right? Christian DJing or? No, just like okay. 
whatever would get the party going. All right. Yeah. And then um, uh, play music, clearly, right? right? So we have a lot of common interests and background, and you know, he likes sports and whatnot. And so it was really easy to connect with him. So he shared what he was up to. I shared what I was up to. And he had dreams of um, kind of changing his consultancy so it wasn't a one-man band. Mm. And I showed up, and he thought, hey, I'm going to bet on this young kid with dreadlocks and see if he could do something with my company. And he gave me a lot of freedom, gave me money. I could make all the mistakes on his dime. It was a great, great experience. And hopefully oh. I did something back for him right? because <laughs> right. he did a lot for me. Yeah, so what... what um was that the Robbins and Associates? Yeah, that's right. Mm. And that was all space and tech and just yeah. bonkers clients. So it's like Bonk, bonkers clients, right? bonkers clients. Was DARPA? I, I just tried looking. I yeah. couldn't find it. <laughs> I was like, what the hell is that? Everybody, right? His clients were everybody. How in Michigan? Yeah. I, I mean, I guess there's probably a whole industry in Michigan outside of Detroit or Ann Arbor that I don't know that's related to manufacturing. That's technological because of the car industry so sure is that the connection there or what no, was he, he had just built his his reputation over the years mm. leveraging his uh, academic credentials as a as a doctor in a certain field and in the social sciences right and um as a just phenomenal public speaker as well and an author uh, his influence spread um amongst um diversity and inclusion innovation circles um and he was one of the people who was really advancing the field. Uh, he would get calls from literally every famous organization you can think of mm. to come and keynote speak. So, you know, when you're you know, speaking in front of audiences that are pretty large, there's always somebody in there who's influential and they'll say, oh, that was great. We right. want you at our organization right, too. Yeah, yeah. So he went viral huh. you know, before viral became a word. Right, right. Well, I, I guess, you know, we could reverse engineer or, or look back over history and pick out viral characters from Oscar acceptance speeches or, you know, maybe even the predicates for that big movies, big things. So yeah, I guess viralness has always been viral, but maybe not as fast. Right. <laughs> and we would have caught on, you know, the Wells Fargo guy maybe caught on slower, but was, you know, on the rail car going across the country and gave a great speech and it got reported, but huh. So he was always on the road, Always speaking, getting paid dollars. Uh, oh yeah, financing the company with income and big bucks. Had guys like you that he took a chance on, and or you know hired, then maybe yeah. take a chance, and and so you were doing that at night or during the day and mixing your classes up, or maybe some semesters you had three classes as opposed to twelve, and you were bordering part time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sometimes the class load would be slimmer, and I'd yeah. be working whenever. Uh -huh. um, you know. He, he was also a, a pretty uh, forward thinker. It wasn't a you know, eight, eight to five, right. sit in your seat type of job. It was more of a, you're a knowledge worker. I respect that. You do the work whenever you need to do the work. We just need outcomes by these dates. Go figure it out. And here's some money. Here's some budget. Yeah. Very reasonable. So I built out a team for him at one point. Uh, just hired a bunch of like fellow students to do different projects. We delivered like an animation to Disney, mm. which was funny to think about that we delivered an animation to Disney. Right. And diversity <laughs> inclusion, which arguably at that point, right. Or something of that nature, right. Something yeah, exactly. unrelated to turnstiles moving faster or the speed of magic mountain. It was yeah. about staffing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. How funny is that? It was a great, great experience. Right. And I'm, huh. I'm, you know, he, he knows that I'm forever grateful. Yeah. And, yeah. He's a great guy. And he's still around working or retired. Yeah. He's still around working. Nice. Yeah. So he's on some list for speakers for 50 grand and you can have him fly out and do the thing. That's awesome. I mean, some people saw, see things in advance, right? Just sort of pluck it out of the air. So did you, um, stay in the city and he went on the road or did you travel with him or the team and did you did you get you've already traveled at this point you've already moved to hong kong you've already been in in, in deserted parts of canada far away from things and you had to make do and then you went to the big city in canada and got big city boy there and <laughs> figured out what 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 burned you when you touched it and what didn't and other things um were you in a mind that I'm going to start traveling? Has this already taken over your life? Or was that not part of your personality at that point? At that point, it wasn't mm. part of my personality to travel like I, like I do today. Yeah. Um, uh, it was, he would take us 
to his clients on select uh, events. Like, right. for example, when NASA was running uh, a certain program for three days, he flew us all out there to NASA, which was really cool to yeah. you know meet these people who are at the top of their game in this particular field, right? Florida, Texas, California? This was in Texas. Yeah. Yeah, nice. I, I believe. Yeah, outside, it was Texas at the time. Outside of Houston there, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. It was really cool. So, um, yeah, there would be select select events we yeah. to. Nice. And we'd, we'd do, you know, sometimes we'd speak on something or sometimes we would uh, deliver something or just help out, or just be around. Yeah, um, yeah, do a workshop or... Yeah, exactly. Whiteboard, yeah. Well, nice. And so now are you thinking, hmm, the major is now firmly what used to be the minor and the minor is now the major <laughs> is, is flipping before your eyes. Yeah. Was there any, darn, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't go to the crass craven side of life and sell things. I should continue the path of the believer or was there none of that uh, false? I think, I think there's always, you know, it, it's, it's like uh, being, being a Christian, you, it influences everything that you do. Yeah. Right. Uh, at least for me, it does. Uh, it's not a Sunday event. Um, and for those where it is a Sunday event, you know, that, that's great. I hope it works, works well for them. I'm sure they're doing the best that they can. Um, but the way that I watch my dad live his life, right, in particular, it was interwoven into everything that, yeah. that he did, right? Sunday is just, I, I, Sunday service is just one thing out of many things in life. So, yeah, it was just, you know, throughout life, whatever decisions are being made or how you conduct yourself, um, there's a thought always of, Hey, you know, how, how am I, how am I coming across? Mm. That's interesting. I mean, that's, I, if I had, if I would have guessed or said that I'd have said there's been serious modeling in this young man's life, <laughs> but you know, it's just, it's funny to hear you say that. So, um, mom, did she play that same role or was she a support character in his larger role? And was that the expectation? I'm tr trying not to sounds idiotic and I should probably not even ask this, but, um, did she play the same type of role? Mom, mom was a, a very, tr mom is a, a very traditional East Asian supportive wife kind of role, right? It, it fits the stereotype really well. Yeah. How, you know, keeps the home, um, you know, makes sure that we're, we're fed, you know, we're, we're dressed, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> dress moderately well, you right. know, our hair is not crazy. Change your shirts uh, <laughs> 20 days in a row. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so she, she played that role and, and I, I believe she really enjoyed playing that role too. Yeah. And then she also, um, kind of got into a few, a few, I don't know if you can call them, call them hobbies necessarily, but she got really into nutrition, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And that actually had a big influence on me growing up too, just yeah. seeing how she approached nutrition. And to this day, I think of food as medicine. Yeah. Well, I imagine the, the hearing loss thing probably said we got to change some things and let's yeah. do food too, right? You're so, right. You're right. Um, it did. Right. I mean, it, yeah, I think the tide is turning slowly as uh, my generation and others like mine start to fade out as, you know, you attack everything, you, you know, okay, you're sick. Let's run through it. Nutrition, you know, yeah. it's just Exercise, cleanliness. Yeah. The sleep, whole thing, right? Gut health. <laughs> yeah. You know, whatever, then we'll figure whatever's out. trendy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then we'll figure out how you do yeah, it. Very right? holistic approach. Right. Okay. So now, um, you graduate six years, you have two companies or two jobs that you've had during this in, in the nighttime, probably you're probably working 60 hours a week and studying whatever you need to do to study and graduate. So that's probably a hundred hour a week. So you got the, the bug of limited sleep or <laughs> sleeping when you can and yeah. working late. And so if you said you're going to have the project done, it would be done and you'd have stayed up till three in the morning to do it uh, night yep. in and night out. So you become what seems to be the classic uh, uh, millennial in terms of day is night, night is day, get your work done at your comfort, at your leisure and map out your strategies uh, yeah time management yeah i mean that was a crash course in time management right there yeah. crash course also in like how do you fall asleep and sleep because if your brain is buzzing <laughs> right. yeah right right with all the things going on were you doing coffee and coke coca-cola then or nothing no stimulants at the right. time still really no stimulants yeah right i've noticed that yeah but i, I definitely you know tried a few things and i read a lot thankfully uh reading is the best you know you can, I feel like you can read your way out of any problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so if it was about sleep or if it's about time management, there are books on all of that. Yeah. Huh. And so, okay. So then, then uh, you graduate with a degree and you're still staying in the same job, but full time? 
Uh, I switched to, I got recruited um, by the founder of a startup uh, uh. in the, the city of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Always right, right, a fun, right. fun city to, to pronounce. Just an hour away from Grand Rapids. Yeah, that was a nemesis city of ours because we always had the Western Invitationals for tennis in Kalamazoo. So if you didn't make it to oh. Kalamazoo, you had failed in your year's achievement. Tennis is big. Right? There's some there's some big uh, tennis schools out there. Yeah, they know. had the big Invitational that included my state of Wisconsin. So we were nice. we were neighboring at different decades. But um, so was this c- company you're talking about? I'm sorry to cut your narrative off. It wasn't Bloomfire because that was already yeah. in existence. Bloomfire. Oh, okay. All That's right. the one. And that was, um, did you say there was a person you met in Kalamazoo or was it the company that recruited you? Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, the company at the time was like two people. Yeah, okay. But it was Josh Little, the founder of Bloomfire, that found me at a conference that I was speaking at on social media. And I was basically embarrassing myself on stage. <laughs> and I, I literally mean I was embarrassing myself on stage. It, yeah. was, it was very bad. Uh, and he was in the audience. He <laughs> said, you're horrible. I was horrible. But you're up there. I was up there. Right. How'd you get up there, son? <laughs> I, I don't remember how I got up there, but I was up there and I was awful. I'll tell you how awful I was. Mm-hmm. At the time, I didn't even know what a panel was. Yeah. That's but right. I, was a, I was a panelist right. on a panel. I thought I was going to be alone here. <laughs> and uh, I thought that I had to like prepare a speech of some kind <laughs> as a panelist. So when the... <laughs> yes. Did you do it? Yes. Dear ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, some fellow Kalamazooians, I'm here today to talk about social media. They're like, you just ask your question, you idiot. Yeah, yeah, it was that bad. It was that the, the, the host of the panel said, um, do you, any of you have opening remarks? Oh, jeez. And that's when I, when I bust out my little index cards that I prepared. Oh, nice. And I gave a little five-minute, you know, punchy yeah. prepared remarks. Did you have a, a suit, tie? Oh man, I forgot how well or how poorly I was dressed. At Did the your time. mom mail you the clothing from Hong Kong? Said, "Son, here's the the silk Ooh. tie." <laughs> I will say, I will say, I don't think I was dressed that badly. You, know? <laughs> okay. you, you got to learn how to dress when you're living in Hong Kong. Grow up in Hong Kong, right? it's a fairly just, fashionable city. You're back in the Midwest. So I think I think I was I was decently put together. But uh, one of the audience members was Josh Little, and I guess he saw something in right, me okay. when I was embarrassing myself, yeah. and he reached out, and the rest is history. Yeah. So then you go in there and you guys expand that company together or you expanded it with him or yeah. uh, he asked you to help him expand it? Yeah, I joined, I joined the company as employee number two or something like that. Yeah. Um, at the time, it was like me, David, the, the software engineer, yeah. really, uh, and a CTO type. Uh, and then there was me. And then we, we later hired more people. But um, it, was, it was a great, and it was, it was hard. It was hard. And, I'm, and Josh was the best boss I've ever had. All right. I mean, Dr. Steve Robbins was also a great boss. Mm-hmm. Josh was also really, really good. First. And he taught me a lot about how to be a leader, honestly. Uh, great role model. Great guy. Love him to bits. Um, and, and Josh, you know, would be very open in like how hard it was at times. Yeah. Right? Like, oh man, we're dealing with a cash crunch. And, you know, it was, it was self-funded. It was funded from his other company that was a, a e-learning consultancy. Mm. So it was, it was tough. Uh, and he would show that. And it, kind of taught me that, look, this is not easy stuff, yeah. right? What was your primary product? Uh, a software product that did, quote unquote, social learning. Okay, um, social learning. So you could say um, you could do demographic breakdowns that were how is the city of Kalamazoo educated and who is where? Or mm. is that not social learning? I'm trying to figure like out what a, social learning would be. Think of, think of like a, a portal. Mm that you can brand as your own. Okay. And this portal is uh, internal to your company. Your employees join this portal and it's like a mini social network uh, that's focused on learning, not networking. Right. So um, Knowledge Planet is going to show us uh, five easy steps to contracting. Sure. And that five easy steps to contracting was posted by your head contract writer. Right. Who knows a thing or two about it? Right, John from Contracts is going to teach you today, and so it's bingo. Sort of and you know, Sally from HR is going to teach you how to do conflict resolution right, right. today. Right? Okay, so I, I get the point of that. So it doesn't you don't sell this to the um, at home worker to toil it with alone. You sell it to a company that needs to create not an external social network, but an internal one that 
uh, who furthers the cause of the company and the individual. Yeah, well, now we got to that after trying to <laughs> okay. sell that software as a way for you to sell your knowledge online yeah, yeah, okay. and, and this and that, right? Oh, right. As yeah, startups I'm, do. Yeah, see, I take the company side, you take the creation side. That's funny. I was viewing it from what is Big Brother going to get out of this to keep his folks mm. entertained but also educated, and you're thinking of it. I'm going to aggregate all this stuff that people need to sell, and I'm going to put it in this portal. And alongside worker Sally stuff, we're going to have you know how to wear gloves, PPE, personal protective gear, and sure. and we got the right guy who does this because they've sold a gazillion of these things, and no one's ever gotten hurt. Yeah, that was my crash course in like go to market. What right. the heck is go to market? Right. And like what the right. heck is like product market fit? You know, this these are all Silicon Valley words. And I got really into the thick of it, but that was my, you know, mm. firsthand experience learning all that. And, you know, we, we, we figured it out enough to have a, a somewhat meaningful exit like 20 months after we launched the company at right. South by Southwest. So that was a, a feather in my cap. I didn't really know how much of a feather it would be, but it definitely opened doors for me when I later went to Silicon Valley. Yeah, that's interesting. So I think probably in the next bit of our discussion, your vocabulary is going to outstretch mine by a lot, and we're going to hear a lot of things. But just even mentioning South by Southwest as an objective from uh, the boy from Hong Kong via Canada, via San Francisco, you moved pretty quickly because that's a, a platform place, right? It's yeah. like skipping Sundance <laughs> and, yeah. go, and going to the big movie release somewhere, yeah. can or something. You got it. That was that was around the time where South by was launching Twitter. Mm. South by was launching Foursquare when Foursquare was right. big. Pete, Some of these biggest startups. Pete Townsend was given the keynote address and just the magnitude of it gotten huge. Well, that's interesting. And so did you go there to dispose of the company or to sell the company? Was that? But no, that, we were there to acquire customers. We, we went there to exhibit with our software trying to acquire customers. And I met the guy who later ended up basically telling his boss to buy our company. Yeah. Yeah. I just met him at some coffee shop. Lounge. Right? Uh, yeah. Interesting. Nice, nice guy. Yeah. Still st keep in touch. That's how you operate. No, I've, I've lost, lost touch with that gentleman. Okay. I mean, he's in my LinkedIn somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which you've never posted on just for the record. Yeah, never. <laughs> you're obviously never very, you're a very yeah. <laughs> intense <laughs> LinkedIn user. <laughs> All right, so you you go to, um, this is where it gets interesting, is you got this Kiss Metrics, which I'm, I'm, I, I forget now. I thought it was in San Francisco. I can't yeah. really read yeah. my notes here. You're right. And then you, there was another one, and it, it, things were running concurrently for some of this. So there were yeah. probably sales and process, and you're moving your other, other businesses. Um, same same type of knowledge base for Kiss Metrics, and then into five hundred startups. Or are you are the are you now moving into the money side and the financing side? Uh, not not quite yet. Mm. Not quite yet. Um, Bloom Fire Feather in the Cap Open Doors in Silicon Valley. Um, that led me to Kiss Metrics, where um, Heaton Shaw and Neil Patel, uh, those two gentlemen, they were really really welcoming. Um, and uh, Kissmetrics at the time was one of the darlings of the analytics world. This mm. is when analytics started getting big, uh, web-based analytics, event tracking, et cetera. Uh, but I honestly didn't, I wasn't chasing trends. I, I got lucky, for sure I got lucky. I wasn't chasing trends. I just remember at the time What that, would be the trend you were chasing then, analytics? Yeah, that would have okay, been the trend right, at the right, time. Right, that would have right, been so. the hot thing right, at the right. time. But so. I, I had no idea it was hot, it was just that Heaton Shaw and Neil Patel were really good to me and we used their product at Bloomfire and I liked using it hmm. and I and I understood how valuable it was. So when I had the opportunity, well, when I got fired from Bloomfire, because that ended up happening, I got fired after it got acquired. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're smiling. It looks like it wasn't a painful firing. It was a very painful firing. <laughs> oh, all right. It was a very painful firing, <laughs> no, but it taught me a lot, right? right? Early in my um, career. I didn't mean to laugh. No, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. It, looking back, you know, it wasn't, that painful and it was very formative and very helpful. I wouldn't right. change it for the world. Right. But at the time it was like, I'd never been fired before. Right, right, you right, know? right, right. I was a high performer all throughout, right? right. Yeah, so right. getting fired and the circumstances where it happened, which was somewhat dubious. Um, uh, but uh, I, I reached out to um, the analytics companies at the time. Uh, and Kiss the big Metrics one, being one of them. Kiss Metrics being one of them. But uh, the one that was hiring was Mixpanel which is still around today and is actually a really huge company. And so I actually interviewed for Mixpanel's uh, head of marketing position. Uh, 
they ended up not hiring me. I, I don't think they actually gave me a decision. Did they give me a decision? I can't remember, but they, I don't think they were going to hire me. But I, I told Keaton, who I'd already met, I told him, hey, I just want you to know I'm interviewing for a competitor. Um, I just want you to know that all the mm. things you told me about your product, I'm not going to tell them. Like, I'm not, I'm not a jerk like that. Okay. Um, just a courtesy note that I thought would be important because I respected him and he treated me well. And he told me, hey, no, 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 don't, don't interview for them. We're hiring as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. I said, no you're, no, you're not. Your job's page has nothing on it. You're not hiring. Uh, but, but, you know, he is good at recruiting and he, he, he lured me in. Uh, make it sound so negative. He, he, he didn't lure me in. But, right. But he, he pulled me in. Enticed you. Enticed me, thank you, <laughs> and gave me a wonderful opportunity. Yeah. And I joined. And it was great. So help me uh, sort of define things here a little better. So my learning... Um, is largely Netflix driven, I think, at this point. So billionaires, the good guy versus the bad guy. The good guy has his quants that do investment analyzing, and they do it at a at a high level of mathematics because they feel there's precision to it that can allow them to get advantages. Are, are analytics in the way we're talking about it now in the in the um, vein of just marketing and selling of products? That are not financial necessarily. They're they're like the things on this table. Yeah. Um, so analytic. You're you're right. By the way, analytics is a really really broad word. Uh, Kiss metrics at the time and mix panel at the time were pieces of software that you would integrate into your software products or your websites, hmm. and that would allow you to track all of the people using your website using your software and trace their user journeys all throughout and they could study that in many different ways which would allow you to be more effective in how you make changes to your website or make changes to your software product hmm. it's funny you mentioned this today oh really why so well because i uh, i have a it guy who helps me with this stuff um we have the second newsletter for roman anton coming out today and we use brevo which is out of France, I guess. And it allows me to do that. So one of the things that I can punch on is when people open up the newsletter, it shows where in the world they do that. Um, and I assume I'm uh, practicing and <laughs> subject to analytics now. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting for a couple of minutes when I do it, and then I sort of lose my desire to, to break that down. But um, it sounds like I'm on to an understanding here that I didn't have before. And so you were doing this and Kissmetrics, uh, not Bloomfire, but Kissmetrics now was offering your job to come in and do this. And I assume, unless it was 2020 or later, that this was um, a developing science or a developing yeah. field. Yes. And that Kissmetrics could have been anywhere or- We were or cutting nowhere. edge. Right. We were cutting edge. And so- 10 people, two people, five people, 100 people, 4,000 people. If you said that Kissmetrics had 22,000 employees, I'd say, gosh, that's, I, I believe you. I have no reason to think they'd be small or big. But there are a lot of industries I just don't know about, and I know this would be one of them. So um, what was your expectation of this coming into it? Were you thinking, I'm underprepared to do analytics? I'm awesomely prepared, except for that one speech I gave. Um, or was your mindset? Because you now are far away from your major, which turned into your minor, which is, you know, theology or religion, whatever you were going to call it. And you moved into your, um, I think we called it marketing, right? Yeah. Side. And now you're, you've gone through two jobs and you've developed things in particular, working closely with one of the most bureaucratic enterprises in the world, but the enterprise that put a thing on the moon so you know, smart dudes and yeah. women right yes and so you're already swimming in very deep waters and now you're going to start to break it down and explain how it works to people yeah i felt i felt um there's a there's a small part of my background which became really useful mm. and that is when i was in high school i graduated high school half a year early because mm. i learned i could i had enough credits somehow <laughs> okay. and i said well then i'm out of here yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. why would i stay <laughs> And so during that period, I was also teaching myself how to program. Oh, nice. I wouldn't ever call myself a software engineer. Right. But I was at the time doing like the 1990s version of like full stack software engineering, front and back end, right? Which is like the visual interface that people use and also the back end database infrastructures, et cetera, that people don't see, but drive everything, right? Mm -hmm. I was doing all of that. Um, and I was self-taught and I was good enough to like actually ship things. So things would go live and people would use it, but not good enough to, you know, be a 
lead engineer at Google, for right, example, right, right? Not even right, close. Right, right. But all that technical stuff, right, became really useful at Kissmetrics because it is a highly technical product. Right. You are dealing with software engineers who are asking a bazillion questions on how in the world do I install your software into my website or mm -hmm. my software product or my mobile app, et cetera. Right. right. I get that. So that was the time when I would, it would buy something and then I'd have to call somewhere and I'd have problems and it would just I'd like, hey, hey, it's Nemo here. I'm at Kiss. And you're not the phone dude, but. You, oh, sometimes I would be. And this was the stuff that was going out in releases. Well, we're going to have that fixed in the next package in March. Just very sort of um, regimented, right? It wasn't this free flowing thing like you have 500 updates on your computer if you play. <laughs> And it just happened if you turn it on, right? Yeah, it's just funny hearing history. And it's not even yeah. distant history, right? It's just, mm -hmm. so you're doing this and you're in, okay, so let's talk about the move. So you're leaving uh, Michigan and now you're in the big city for keeps because you're a salaried worker somewhere. And you move into San Francisco in the heart or you move outside, is the office outside Oakland or is it, uh, heaven forbid, an even more expensive place or? Sure, sure. I was, uh, let's see, at the time, let me remember. Uh, I was in Utah, actually. I'd relocated to Utah wow. because uh, Bloomfire started recruiting well in Utah. We were <clears throat> struggling to recruit in Michigan as hard as we tried. I love you all Michiganers, but at the time, there were like no tech people in Michigan. So we were finding success in Utah. I relocated to Utah. I had a challenging time in Utah living there. <laughs> Uh, and so I was happy to leave Utah mm -hmm. and go to Silicon Valley and go to San Francisco, Menlo Park. Well, Silicon Valley. History would have it. Silicon Valley is south of San Francisco at the time, but now Silicon Valley is basically the whole, the whole San Francisco down all the way down to Palo Alto. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I moved over there and I was in uh, Daly City, okay, which is south yeah, right of the city. I was really close to a BART station. BART is their little train, which I love. And so I could go door to door from my little room in a four bedroom college house to the office on Market Street, which is downtown San Francisco. What was the address on Market door. Street? It was in the 700s, okay. uh, 700 something Market Street. I think it was the 12th floor right. uh, facing Market Street, uh, right in the thick of it. Um, that yeah. must've been exciting. It was very exciting. It was a very lively time. Market Street today is dead. Yeah, it's different. It's different. I yeah. saw it just a, like a month ago, and it was shocking to me how much things have changed. Uh, it's a bit sad, actually. Yeah. But at the time, it was extremely lively, hustle bustle. It was great. And yeah. I mean, literally across the street was the Four Seasons. And so if we looked out the window, we would see a bus stop by, and the bus was loaded with NBA players yeah. who would get out because they were the visiting team to play the Warriors. You'd see all these people hunting for autographs. And then some of the guys who would work with me, they would go to the Four Seasons gym at lunch and they would say, hey, you'd never guess who I was just working out next to. Yeah, yeah. That was Grant Hill. Yeah. And the guy was like, yeah, it's really me. I'm really Grant Hill. Because <laughs> yeah, I was just yeah. gawking at the guy. So it was, it was a good time, right? Really fun. Yeah, we had an office at 55 Market for a long time for a, a company that worked down there. <laughs> and that, that basketball court was fairly notorious for having... Good the Four games, Seasons, right? yeah. the Four Seasons basement, the Equinox down there had a full court indoor court, and right. that's where the visiting teams would practice, and they had good runs too. What were your favorite outside courts in San Francisco? Did you have any? Uh, I didn't really have any other than the one that I lived really close to, because that would be where I play a little bit. In Daly City. Yeah, in Daly yeah, City. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing remarkable about yeah. it at all. Yeah. I had one over in the, the marina that I would go play at that was outside. Oh, nice. It was so cold. I just remember getting a lot of jammed fingers there because it was cold. It was cold. You never loosen up. Yeah, <laughs> it was it's true. Cold. Yeah. yeah you got to tuck your fingers in your armpits to right. warm them up. Yeah. So at this point, you've developed a, a healthy to bordering on unhealthy um, appreciation for basketball. Now you're in, like you've said, you're in your early 20s, and you're, and you, but you also love ball. So now you're in a good ball city, and you're timing it right with the ascendance of the new kings of basketball yeah. there. So tell me about it. Good time to be there. And they Great just time. moved there, right? So you, yeah. you were catching them and you're leaving Utah, which also had a good team. That couldn't have been too bad. You probably had tickets to see the jazz there. Yeah, I've seen, uh, did I see the jazz? I think I saw at least one, one jazz game, yeah, but yeah. yeah, that was the one kind of shining light in Utah was that people like to play. Yeah. Uh, they love BYU, right? The college team. Yeah, they love sure. Jammer for debt. 
And at lunchtime, we have lunchtime ball, you know, we go to the yeah. community center behind the Bloomfire office there and we play some pickup, which was great. Yeah. So the um, um, irony doesn't escape me. It may not be ironic at all that uh, the religious community in Salt Lake was strong. And Very strong. You were hip with that. I was, it was a different religious yeah. community. Uh, I will say that uh, LDS folks, are some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. You know, love them. They just really hard work ethic, all that. It's just I don't I don't believe some of the things that they really believe in. But that doesn't mean I can't break yeah. bread with them. I yeah. can't share a meal. Can't play basketball with them. I can't love them. You know, yeah. I can still do all of that, right? But just at a fundamental core level, there's just some differences. Yeah. And so now you're in San Francisco, and it's the Wild West, and you're yeah. living in Daly City, and. Uh, you're going to work there forever or are you already thinking making moves? You know, I, I read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad huh. when I was uh, early at Bloomfire. It was Josh's copy on the, on the little company bookshelf. And it, <laughs> it really it really left an impression on me uh, because yeah. I knew from that book. What, that, that your company had a bookshelf or that you, <laughs> the book that you read? <laughs> oh, no, it was just a, a small little bookshelf with like okay. most of Josh's books in there. Right. That's all. Right, it yeah. was Josh. <laughs> I can yeah, see like, like his he's reading three books a week, type A, right? And yeah. You guys are like, oh, where are these books coming from? I mean, I love to read, right? <laughs> I, I just always have, thankfully. Comical. Okay, so then you, 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 you read this, and the book says to you, like rich being, dad, poor dad. Being an employee is, is not going to be my future. Yeah. You know, being a, a lifer as an employee is just not going to, that's just not the way to approach life. Or working for money. someone else, you mean? Uh, being an employee. Mm. I, I don't mind working for someone else. We'll just have to talk about how, how the economics are structured mm. in that work arrangement, right? right? I'd be happy to work for you. If, for example, I get a share of the upside, right, or I own some equity yeah, yeah. Well, okay. that's liquid, et cetera, et cetera. So, does being uh, the employer or the employee in your definition mean? Okay, yeah. So you could work at Exxon Mobil if. Bam. Okay. All right. So if, I get. It. All right. So let's the, get into the details of, right, right. of what that is. It a JV? You right, know? Right, is it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. I'm, right. I certainly won't be in the office is probably going to be your opening statement. Like, I mean, I'm, I could be, I don't, okay. I don't mind. I like office culture too, right? Teams, teams are fun. Yeah, Building fair teams is fun. Yeah. Fair enough. That's it. I was, I was, but I, I get what you mean. Yeah. 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 It, it'd be a bit non-traditional. Right. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then you're, 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 you read the book and you're thinking while you're there. Okay. I get it. And then, then what happens? Does the, the nature of what you're selling change? Yeah, I think at that point, even in, in Utah, I already started doing this. I was thinking to myself, well, I have all these skills on how to make money for other people, yeah. marketing and sales skills. I could also use those skills for myself. Right. And so it began the journey of trying a lot of different uh, marketing and sales activities, which would generate income for me. Hmm. And so one of the earliest things that I did was I was an affiliate for Noah Kagan. And uh, Noah Kagan is a name where in Silicon Valley circles, some people would recognize the name. Outside of Silicon Valley, maybe not so much. But Noah was someone, I forgot how I met him, honestly, maybe at some conference or something. But Noah was, uh, he's best known as uh, the sixth employee at Facebook or something mm. like that, or 20. I, I don't know. He was really, really early at Facebook. And then he got fired from Facebook. He tells a whole story about how he got fired, etc. cetera. Um, and then he went off and did his own thing and was quite good at it. Um, sorry, a company called AppSumo, which was how I uh, did some affiliate work for AppSumo at the time. And I started, you know, basically getting users for him for AppSumo for, you know, like a dollar per user or something like that. Mm. And I used some of my skills on software engineering and automation, et cetera, to acquire users for him. And I started getting these checks from Noah. And I thought to myself, oh, this is interesting. Like, I'm, I'm doing it for myself. It's not taking me a lot of time. These, this little stack of Mac minis is doing all the automation work to do the work for me. These robots are working for me and I'm making money in my sleep. This is kind of nice. Mm. And so, you know, once you get that taste of success and you realize that, wait, all these things I read in the book are not that out of reach for me. Of course, it's my own flavor. There's nothing in the book that says, buy a bunch of Mac minis right. automated and do, right. no, it doesn't. You got to right. still connect the dots. But it, it kind of got my brain going and then one success led to another as I tried more and more things. And eventually I landed on the e-commerce play that made it work for me. And so this e-commerce play, is this you in your apartment, wherever it is, 
two in the morning after you watched whatever short clips you like to watch because you're not watching network TV anymore and you got a dog or a bunny rabbit or whatever falls into your your <laughs> your thing and are these light bulbs going off or is it less romantic than that? Is this yeah. just trying to get, you know, the Mac minis to do this thing and she spilled the coffee one day and the next day it's the power goes out and the third day is an earthquake and it's just, or, or how is this working or is it an epiphany? I yeah, guess. it's, it's, it's a lot of trial and error. Mm -hmm. And it was also some great role models that I had, like, for example, at bloom fire, um, we hired, a gentleman called Chris Finken. Chris, I love you if you're watching this. You know, Chris uh, showed me how he was uh, being a full-time employee at Bloomfire, but on the side, he was actually like running this e-commerce business out of a little warehouse, um, and he was doing quite well. He probably made more money doing that than the full-time job, honestly, right? And he was selling on eBay. He was selling on his own sites, and he showed me how it worked. And I remember watching, you know, him do his thing, and I thought to myself, I have all the skills right. to do all of this. <laughs> Right, like I know Chris pretty well. In fact, I have some advantages on him. Like I, I can code, he can't. Yeah, yeah. So, hmm, what, what's my version of this? And so copying him later on after the Mac minis and Noah Kagan and all that affiliate work, it became a matter of, well, what if I like sell some stuff on eBay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. I did that in college. I would go to Guitar Center on Black Friday, <laughs> right? Like buy a bunch of Rocket <laughs> studio monitors for cheap and then sell it on eBay and make, make, some, make some money on it, right? Buy low, uh -huh. sell high. Uh, yeah. Like, what if I just did this, but in a more methodical fashion, right. more serious, yeah. et cetera. And so, you know, trying one thing, trying another, then the niche that I landed on while I was literally sitting on my bed after getting home from my day job at Kissmetrics in my, you know, one bedroom room with a shared bathroom, a shared kitchen. With in like, Daily City. In Daily City with mm. like three other roommate guys who went to college somewhere, right? As I'm sitting on my bed, because that's all I have is a bed right. in this room. No desk. Uh, no desk. Yeah. I have two laptops, because that's where I spent my money. Right, right. <laughs> and I'm watching NBA on one, <laughs> whatever the live stream is right now. I won't tell you how I got the live stream. Right, of course. And on the other laptop, I have literally a spreadsheet, very boring spreadsheet of, of products and data. And I'm just scrolling through this, trying to hunt using some tools for products that I could resell for a profit, mm. right? And when you find one, you try, you have to go and buy the product or you sell the product. And eventually I figured out that there are these board games that I could sell. And so Zombicide of all board games was according to the data, the one where I could source for cheap and I could sell on, I think it was Amazon and eBay. And I remember posting it and then I went to bed and I woke up and I saw three sales and I was like, wait, let me do some math on this. Like three sales is equal to this much in profit. Hmm. And then the sales kept coming in. Uh. And I realized when I did the math, I thought to myself, I can make more money selling this than working at my day job. Selling just Zombicide or you have this just spreadsheet Zombicide. with 20 similar products? Selling just Zombicide alone. <laughs> okay. I can make more money Zombicide. selling just Zombicide alone than my six-figure day job at Kissmetrics. So this was a time. chance to give up the name Nemo from the Korean girl and go to the new name of Zombicide in, in terms of immensity of the moment, right? Yeah, I should probably get Zombicide like <laughs> tattooed to my body just because of what a turning point Zombicide now, was. Let's just make sure we don't have some product infringement or resale <laughs> thing here. Like Zombicide's going to say, wait, son, we're going to audit your books. So, so this spreadsheet was this just an excel spreadsheet that you had data in that you were compiling from things you grabbed and put in and said price versus sale and it you connected a price sale thing on the spreadsheet and said wait a minute yeah and yeah. then you said i'm gonna buy three from somewhere and i'm gonna sell them right now and see what happens so you had some nemo's treasure chest on board on online and three people bought it and you're like i didn't even have to do anything for that other than populate it yeah basically i mean i had software <laughs> engineering skills so i could scrape right these web pages and scrape it and normalize the data and then populate these spreadsheets and then i could scan through it I see and what you're saying. Yeah. blah 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 and so i was using kind of the the unfair advantage i had with some of the skills that i developed to make my version of this e-commerce play which yeah, is different yeah. from chris's Right. And so right, I get you. So that, that led to another, you know, yeah. Zombicide is one. And then that led to another. It was just a matter of process, right? right? You follow the process. You're going to pan for gold. You pan enough times, you'll find little specks of gold, right? And I just had like a panning machine. Right. Just pan, 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 pan. And I would watch NBA and stare at spreadsheets. 
after work until eventually, you know, I quit my job at Kiss Metrics, even though I love the people there. I built yeah. my team there, yeah. right? I have, you know, all, all the best things to say about everyone I worked with over there. Um, still have great relationship with Neil and Heaton, you know, text them, talk to them, um, visit them when I can, right? All, all that stuff, right? Yeah. But I knew that, look, I'm not going to sell software for the rest of my life, you know? Oh, yeah. I'm going to sell Zombicide. It takes, you know, an hour a day. And that's when I semi-retired and in my mid-20s. I, I'll work like an hour a day, do this e-commerce thing, and then I'm going to use the rest of my time to figure out what the heck I'm going to do with my life. And yeah. I'll also play basketball. Yeah, yeah. Right. And watch basketball on a, a 78-inch screen TV that you got. I got a projector screen. <laughs> to, right, I eventually got a projector screen, and it was great. <laughs> of course it was. It, it was, was like a 100-inch <laughs> massive projector screen, great surround sound. In your bedroom. Oh, it was great. You slept in a sleeping bag. I upgraded. <laughs> I, I inflated my lifestyle quite a bit in San Francisco. Right, you got the I guys. learned my lesson. You kicked two of the guys up and made one of the bedrooms <laughs> the TV room. I hired one of the guys, actually. There you go. It was kind of fun. So where was this at? So you, you leave... You leave... Um, you leave... Kiss metrics, Bloomfields in the past, Bloomfires in the past. Are, are you into 500 startups yet? Or is uh, this. Where yeah, 500 startups starts entering the picture because I'm semi retired at this point. Mm. Um, I have a, a small reputation in, in San Francisco. Heaton and Neil know a lot of people. They, they are still in the game today. They, they probably know everyone at this point. They're incredible. And so I think just word spreads, and someone called mm -hmm. Matt Ellsworth um, reaches out to me introduces himself to me and says, hey, you know, my name's Matt. I am doing this startup thing and I don't quite know how to solve this marketing sales problem. I was told, um, you know, to give you a call. Right. You know, would you be willing to like have a chat with me? Can we grab a coffee? So what do you said, think sure. that person who described you to Matt said your skill was at this point? Probably sales and marketing, generally speaking. Sales Customer acquisition. All right. So you not selling Zombicide or I forget the name of it already. Um, but an ability to find a zombicide to sell, or which is it? Uh, it's probably just like general huh. sales and marketing, like how to make money and acquire customers. Maybe, maybe it was something like that, how to acquire customers. So product sales. So, okay. Yeah. All right. So you have the skill set now I and do. you're using it and you're making money off it. And, right. that, and you're proving yourself at two companies and now you have a reputation as doing this thing. Right. Right. And, and, you're not necessarily out saying I need a job or I want to get hired. In fact, I'm sort of taking a break, folks. Yeah. But things th keep coming to you. And so people say, hey, help me solve this problem and, and we'll do it on my nickel and I'll pay you to help me solve my problem. And I have all this stuff and it's not selling fast enough. Help me or help me make get bigger. Yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, and, and Matt, you know, great, great guy. He just, he just, you know, earnestly wanted some some thoughts that could potentially help him. And I, I like helping people. I have no issue with that at all. I mean, so many people have helped me, yeah. really. So I, I chatted with him. We went on a walk around, like, uh, the, what was this, uh, around the ballpark, uh, the San Francisco Giants ballpark. <laughs> that was at your the time I, I lived. That was your meeting. At the time I lived by the ballpark. Okay. One of the, in one of the apartments there with a basketball court, indoor court on the bottom. That's why I moved there, because wow. there's an indoor court. Hmm. Um, and I would go to Incorpore every day and play basketball, right? Um, but he met up with me and we went on a walk and, uh, you know, I try my best to help him. And by the end of the conversation, I guess I left an impression and he said, look, I'm part of this 500 startups thing. And I said, oh, I don't, I don't know what that is. Mm. I really didn't. Uh, he said, um, I've, I advise some companies there on marketing and sales. Would you be willing to join me um, and like talk to some of my companies? Mm. Because I think you'd be really helpful. And I said, I'm, I'm flattered. Like, of course, I'd be more than happy to. And I had no idea at the time. Just like I didn't know that Neil Patel and Keaton Shaw are a big deal or Kiss Metrics was a big deal. Right, I had yeah. no idea that 500 startups at the time was one of the top three accelerators in the world mm -hmm. alongside Y Combinator and Techstars, right? So in Silicon Valley terms, like those are the big three accelerators. 500 was one of them. So if you defined accelerator for people who are listening, what would sure. that mean? It would mean that you are a startup and you are frustrated with the lack of progress in your startup. So you decide to join one of the many accelerators out there to hopefully accelerate the progress of your startup. Usually by progress, I mean revenue yeah. of your startup. Right? Do they ask you to join or do you ask if you, if, if you apply to yeah. join the accelerator? And they say, sorry, we're not interested. We don't see it. Sure. We, you don't have the products we like. You're an idiot. Uh, and they invest. It's the wrong color. 
accelerators often invest in the companies they okay. take in. So there's an alignment of economic right, economic alignment there. I as see. Well. So it's not just you counseling to say, hey, if you've used a green background, this is going to sell faster. Or if you use Zombinator or whatever, then you just say, hey, this is, this is the trick to everything. Just get five of those. Okay, interesting. So then you, you meet the accelerator, and is there office near your apartment that now has a basketball court? Yeah, pretty, pretty close. So Everything that, in SF so, is pretty close. So that makes that makes all this real easy. Right? Really easy. If you just said you got to go down to San Diego once a week, you just say, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, or no. maybe you'd have moved down there to play. Yeah, ball. yeah. yeah. Right. San Diego's got a great scene. Right. Well, it does. Okay, so cool. So then you do that, and... and are you, you're not still working with them. No, that's, that's no, oh, done no. for a while now. So... Um, I'm getting the sense probably at this point that you're looking or getting ready to leave California. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was learning a lot about tax. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I was learning a lot about like, well, you know, this becomes your biggest expense yeah. as your income climbs. So yeah. like, how do you be th- smart about that? Yeah. And so you, you, you look at all your options, right? Including like, where do I domicile? Right. Right. So every, everything, you know, trying to get creative, trying to just think and be intelligent with money and, and money matters. And a public declaration on a move to Nevada is sort of the awareness of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> moving to Las Vegas, yeah. you know, it's a state where it's in a, in a state where there's no state tax, right. whereas California has that state tax, and also the commute between the two cities is not that bad if you have yeah. the right setup. Right. Okay. And so, um, um, at some point, you leave that entity, and then you move. Are we rolling into COVID then? Let's Roughly see, I leave, I leave that entity, uh, and no, I don't think we're at COVID yet. Okay. But at that point, I probably start another company. Uh, wait, no, I, I think I sold, I sold some companies, and I start a company or something along those lines. Can't quite remember the sequence of events. So Clifford Underwood has to go under the bus at some point, right? Is yeah, that absolutely. Yours? Right, okay. Yeah, 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 that company has to go under the bus at some point, and then I start IPO Architects with uh, my business partner at the time, Alex, um, and then we, we give that a good go. So now you're shifting into the financial side of it. So somewhere in this, this succession, it, well, it's not a succession, somewhere in the terms of this development that you're, this metamorphosis you're undergoing from religious scholar to marketer to marketer to uh, spreadsheet reader and to laptop, <laughs> one with basketball on it admittedly, <laughs> then into a larger scale of that and then into the sale of these companies or the disposition of these assets, uh, then into a thing called IPO architects away from the accelerator where you got a whiff of, wow, these guys put money into stuff and now I have money and now I'm putting money into stuff or I'm not. Now you're on a side that by the name of it is leaning towards the financial side of it. So you may not even be selling products anymore. You may be selling I don't know what a, what a, companies. Yeah, right. right, yeah. <laughs> right. They could, which could be doing anything. They could be correct charitable foundations, or I don't know what they'd be. But okay, so was that a big transition for you? And was there a whole new vernacular you had to learn, or was it part and parcel what you were doing? Yeah, you know, you're, at the time, it's it's becoming a, a how do you build up your own portfolio, yeah. right? How do you build your own portfolio of of assets? And so the the thinking there leads me down different directions. I'm learning the language of high finance as well along the way. I'm not great at it by any means, but ChatGPT and Google can take you a long <laughs> ways, right? If you just type in the right words, you're like, oh, so that's what that means. I thought you were going to say, you know, Stanford Night School, but no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, no, no desire to ever go back into a classroom at this point, unless you're, te- unless you're, Guest speaking, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I, schools are great. I, yeah, yeah. I love the environments as well. Yeah, of course. You know, so I'm I'm just trying my best, and I'm definitely in over my head as well. I mean, there are you know I'm 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 now dealing with peers who are private equity, yeah. you know, fund managers who are way better at this and financial engineering than I am at this current point. So, you know, finding my space and finding my niche uh, was challenging for many years. Um, and, but eventually, you know, we, we kind of wandered our way through different iterations of our business to get to a point where we're making some money. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm looking down to see if I could jog my memory on what, what, um, just align with what you just said there, uh, from your resume or from the things that I read about you. Um, yeah. And then all of a sudden, 
listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange starts to come up as what you're working with. And it's just, it, you're so far afield at this point so quickly. It's like, wh- why does it transform so quickly? Why is this moving so fast? Yeah. Or is that not how you're feeling? Because it, it seems like you just got blasted off a rocket in terms of what you're working on and the dynamics of what you're working on. So yeah. from, from that spreadsheet to the next level up, advising people on how to fix problems with a larger company than you had yes. probably many times, guys yeah. like, you know, what's happening? You're like, oh, there's a, a nail in the tire. And like, oh, shit, we didn't even see that. Yeah. Uh, to now like, well, you know, you know, you, you got all the textbook stuff on places of incorporation and the type of structure and how you sell it and how you set up the shares. And so you're, you're working at a level that's pretty complex. It's, it's very complex. And yeah. it's, it's, it's so complex that eventually I realized like there's no, it is, it's not wise for me to try to figure this out <laughs> right. on my own because right. the stakes are so high. Yeah. Like I need people yeah. who do this routinely. Yeah. And we were lucky to meet some people out in New York who <clears> we felt we could trust. A gentleman called Juan out of New York who was, was just a, a real kind and understanding and patient mm. person with us who we could lean on and really, uh, when it came to some of these matters, um, we could rely on him. We could also rely on some other people that we, we found. And we just started to focus a lot on uh, relying on these experts instead of ourselves. Yeah, okay. So th- this is interesting, right? So um, sort of like your first boss, whose name I'm drawing a blank on. Um, Dr. Was Steve off, Yeah, given the speeches, you know. Yeah. He hired you for your expertise and something to do stuff in the back room for him. <laughs> and then you paid off for him and you did bigger stuff and then you gave speeches to Nassau people on these topics. And so, um, you're, you're now in a spot where you're sort of doing what he did. <laughs> like, Hey, I need some help oh, with this company I got. Sure. And you're, are you, f- which version of you appears? Are you flying around all these meetings you have? Cause there's too many meetings to go to, but are you getting the backpack on and sitting up in business class and flying to New York for a 30 minute meeting? Or are you, maintaining the lifestyle at home and playing ball once a day <laughs> yeah which version takes over because you've obviously f- haven't faced your demons and beat them but you've put yourself in a better position than worrying about help and support your parents if they need it yeah yeah what version of you appears now because it seems like that's if you have the, the re- retirement word in your lexicon you've addressed the original concerns <laughs> right? yeah which was which were altruistic but was to help you know get a Get, do something that's going to help the family unit. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now you're past that or you're not past it, but you've achieved it. So maybe you get chronically depressed because you're like, wait, that was my only goal and I reached it. Sure. Sure. Or, or how does this work? And then do you turn into a, a different version of the working maniac who's doing 80 hour weeks or were you never that guy? So, so where are you at in all of this? Currently? Yeah. No, maybe right, right when IPO associates, you're going to get rid of it at some point, I assume, or you're, yeah, yeah. yeah that's your next decision. Now do I keep doing this? Cause this is intense and I could do it every hour of every day. Yeah. Nonstop all year yeah, yeah. and make a bundle. But yeah. Do you do that? Or do you sort of say, wait, what am I doing? Yeah. I think a, a couple of factors. Uh, number one was learning that um, there's a point where you've earned enough, mm-hmm. enough money. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a mathematical point. You know, everyone needs to have a number of what enough actually is. And there's ways to do backwards math to figure out what is enough, right? You can do lifestyle costing. You can, for example, design your life and your lifestyle and think to yourself, well, if my life looked like this, and for me, right, what makes me happy, right? Some of my favorite activities don't cost any money. Yeah. Basketball doesn't cost a lot of money unless you want to, it, unless you want it to cost a lot of money. Right. It doesn't usually have to cost you a right. lot of money. League pass and a screen are about the yeah. cost and then you can play in a public court. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> and a, Jordan, a pair of Jordans every six months. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, you can go overboard, but yeah. for the most part, it's my lifestyle is one that I've designed very thoughtfully and, mm. and gone through exercises to do it. And I've realized it doesn't cost a whole lot. Mm. And so when you do some math, you realize that, okay, if I have this amount of money socked away or I deployed in this kind of manner, it generates enough income to mm. cover all my lifestyle expenses. I'm free. I'm financially free at this point, right? I can, I can, if I know what is enough, I can hit that and then I'm done. So you're running, you're currently working with Vaunt, which is a company that seems to sell space on private planes 
uh, that aren't being the space isn't being used so you've found out a way to find out if the general electric plane leaving korea is going back to new york and you can maybe sell a seat on that or something is what it sounds like you're still working on that project Sort of. That's our client at uh, IPO Architects. Uh, ah, okay. The reason why I have it um, titled that way in my LinkedIn profile is to signal. It's so that if people browse my LinkedIn profile because I'm like, the see. name behind a lot of mass communications, they can see, oh, he's associated with Vaughn. He's real. Okay. Right. But um, right. that's, so a, that's I, a client. I, mi- I misrepresented. How no, it's okay. Yeah, you, yeah. you would have never known. And I'm okay. actually glad you said that because it means that what I did on LinkedIn worked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the impression Sneaky. I want to give. So you marketed LinkedIn. to me. I'm not, I even, gotcha. <laughs> I'm not even buying. And I was already thinking, gosh, gotcha. I'm going to get on that bank, <laughs> Bangkok to Auckland flight tomorrow for yeah. $60,000. So, so there, yeah, they're, they're a client of ours at IPO Architects. Uh, okay. You know, and yeah. I, so did you turn into the, I mean, so you, you, you're out in California doing this stuff. You moved to Nevada to escape the tax man uh, or however that works you get these deals and you got new york council and folks supporting it and it's getting all heady were you working more and more yeah i i you know i semi-retired at at around 25 i think it was 25 Mm. semi-retired and i really didn't know how to semi-retire i've learned a lot since then and it basically inertia led me to work more and more again it was Mm. the one thing i was comfortable doing was working so i just you know, kept going and then found myself working so much that I developed anxiety. Yeah. Right. And so I'm, I'm having this like breathing, you know, strain breathing problems mm-hmm. and whatnot. Right. And eventually that gets worse and worse so that, you know, I had like my first panic attack. Right. And I think to myself, well, what, why, why do I, why am I doing this? I don't, I don't need to, right. Uh-huh. I have enough. Right. If I, if I do the math, and so I executed a few maneuvers. I, I bought some homes to rent out. Um, and at that point, I was told myself, I'm done. You know, I'm retired. Like this time, not semi. Like I'm, I'm fully retired. I'm done. Okay. So when I met you, you told me that. And then you have traveled to seven cities <laughs> since the last time you were here. And I have a feeling there was business involved in some of those. No, no business involved. I don't think Frank believes that either, but okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll trust you if you say there's no business follow. Okay, so you're flying around Asia and, and the States. You went back. Yep, yep. Um, and okay, well, good. I think we've run through stuff. So so are you, as, as, a, as a, a businessman? Sure. Yeah, right? <laughs> Retired businessman. Are, is your head constantly still in the game of sales, even though you're not in the game? I mean, are you st- still thinking of you see this thing or you see this company or you hear this person talking like, oh, you could fix that so easily if you just used, you know, nose strips. You know, it's like, come on, you breathe easier. And are you doing that or are you checked out? Are you regressing now and you're like, gosh, I always wanted to watch, you know, Sopranos or something. Uh, you know, have you moved into that early sort of theological or philosophical or artistic side that was out? Or, or what's happened? Has there been a transformation or, or no? Are you still constantly on go? I'm probably in the middle of that transformation. I think the first thing to deal with is just anxiety oh. and how to put that to put that to bed because it's not really that fun to deal with every single day, yeah. the symptoms of it. Uh, I, have, uh, I am an advisor with a handful of climate climate tech organizations. Some of them are called accelerators. Some of them are... I don't even know how to what to call them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's Clean Tech Open, there's Climb Canada, and there's another one. And and, um, and they have companies who are in um, clean tech specifically trying to fight climate change. Uh, and I feel like it's humanity's responsibility, and I'm part of that to somehow um, address this uh, climate change concern. It's an existential threat. Um, and so if I can use my skills in some way that can help that particular cause, of course, I would be uh, happy to do it, right? So, uh, you know, I was on a couple of calls this past week with a certain startup um, that has to do with like sunsetting oil wells in Alberta, uh, right, right. or like close to Medicine Hat yeah. uh, to create carbon credits out of it. Yeah. And they're dealing with revenue problems. And so, yeah, I can definitely, you know, I'm still sharp enough to listen closely, ask uh, hopefully some helpful questions, some probing questions, uncover what the root problems may be, and then uh, share some you know, really practical advice on how to uh, 
deal with that and solve that. Kind of uh, like what I did at 500 startups back yeah. in the day. Yeah, that kind that's, of advising. I was going to ask that. That sounds like the spot, right? I mean, that just, yeah. if you believe the title of the company or the name of it, it sounds like yeah. you could have had a variety of issues for different companies every day, right? Yeah. <coughs> and so are these not, excuse me, are these not for profit or are these associations or are these... Well, they're, they're companies. They're, they're okay. you know, they, they got to run a profit to stay alive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. And so do you see yourself, um, playing that emeritus role or, or being a, a board member going forward and consulting on some level? Or do you say <coughs> the psychology of the, um, uh, anxiety that you have is, will come back if I go jump into that? Yeah, I think, I think there's one thing that makes me okay dealing with anxiety and that is if 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 there's a certain company that can truly make a dent on climate change i will figure out my anxiety if i can help in some kind of way some kind of meaningful yeah. way yeah i follow that for that company to really make a dent in climate change it, it's like it's just so important of a of a problem in in my opinion right mm. um i feel really strongly about that um other than that uh yeah, my, my well-being, my mental well-being, my physical health, et cetera, um, is, is really important. I mean, this is the one body that I have uh, to last me the rest of my life. So, and no one's going to take care of it for me. So I got to yeah. deal with it and, and help myself, right? And so I will. Um, and then there's also nowadays, you know, at, at my age, there are only, um, there's a window for me to still do some things before I can no longer do them. <laughs> Like, for example, I can still somewhat keep up with 20-year-olds on a basketball court. Mm. But as the years go by, yeah. that is less likely. I hear you. So if I want to play at the level that I enjoy playing at, right, and really indulge in that, I only have a small window left. Yeah. And so I'm going to take advantage of that until that door is closed. And that's okay. I accept it. I did the best I could. I had a lot of fun. And I'll move on to the next thing. How old is LeBron now? He's close to 40. All right, I see. Maybe a longer time than you think. But I respect the... the I, I like but hey, the question is, how long is <laughs> Stephen Curry going to play for? Right? That's a game that more he important. Has. Frank's a Steph Curry fan. See, that snapped him out of it over there. He but, could play for a while, man. Steph, his game. Yeah. Boy. So those, um, the Vince Carter posts, getting him his retired jersey, uh, that is the one consistent thing where you actively post on your social medias when it relates to basketball. I enjoy it. Right. My <laughs> friends do too. <laughs> so I share it with them. And so uh, is there anything uh, I, that you thought I was going to ask today about the work stuff that I didn't ask? No. Is there, is there anything you wanted to bring up to sort of punctuate what you've just discussed or what the genesis or odyssey that you're on is uh maybe one 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 uh thing to point out mm. uh i think at, at one point you had mentioned that i was speaking in front of the nasa folks yeah i wasn't really speaking in front of the nasa folks it was more okay. like workshop and things like that. I, I mean i would have loved to speak in front of the NASA yeah yeah folks, i but, get that but i wasn't giving keynotes to nasa yeah <laughs> right and and yeah I, I didn't mean to take a a slight comment to make you sound like you were, you know, leading the next moon mission. But, you know, you go down there and stuff happens, like you said, right? It's sure. a group of folks. Hey, sound right on the board for us. And you're like, okay, I'm on the whiteboard now. Um, okay, good. Good clarification. That's that's uh, some training there we just saw to go clean up the record while we're live. Um, one of the, And so one of the things you've, you've, you and I have talked about is um, looking for a game to play in a new town, meaning basketball. Um, and I've always done that as well. And some places have been harder than others. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had a regular game when I lived in Bangladesh, uh, Nigeria, uh, Saudi Arabia. Nice. Uh, they're always findable if you look. Sometimes uh, you have to come up with the variations, local rules. Sometimes uh, <laughs> people kick balls more than <laughs> you'd imagine and realize it's a soccer country. You know? and so <laughs> the primary line of defense is a foot. <laughs> so you got to watch out those places. But um um, Roman Anton podcast, we do three things. So interview or talk like this. Uh, I think we've, we've reached a, a point. Uh, the second thing is we have a performance. If the person who comes can perform and obviously you can, but that would be in a, in a, um, in a business context. And so what Frank and I did, uh, uh, uh is we agreed that we would play his song. Maybe, uh, we do an acoustic version, uh, with me and him singing. So we're going to do that in a moment and then we're going to jump in the car and drive across town bangkok and go to lumpini park to look at 
a basketball court or two basketball courts quickly, not even playing it, but just to, for you and I to share our thoughts on finding city ball or country ball, if you can do that. You usually don't find 10 people to play with, so you usually got to be in a populated space to find 10 people and maybe share some of our thoughts on that. Is that fair? Sounds great. Well, I appreciate your coming in today. Why don't we, Frank, why don't we take a break and set up for the next piece? And uh, then we will hit the road. But I appreciate your coming in today. Thank you for having me. All right. So, all right, we are back. We are going to watch Frank and I play Maybe, Frank and Ville's Hangad's uh, song, Maybe. And our guest here today is uh, Nemo. Uh, and we've agreed only to do one name because it's cool. Uh, see you in a minute. All right, we're going to do a song that Frank wrote a while back called Maybe, Frank is Ville Hangad. I'm going to accompany him on vocals. Uh, we're here with uh, Nemo Chu today in the Roman Antot podcast. We're going to do this now. How does it feel to fall in love this way? studio thank you okay we so we here we are uh roman anton podcast nemo we are at lumpini park in downtown bangkok middle of bangkok have you been here before nope all right first time so this would be like central park in new york maybe is there a central yeah. park in hong kong not really you go up the hill there's that zoo place but that's not really a big park right i don't think so hmm. we're like big a central central park like new york i mean new york is it's hard to compare to yeah, Central yeah. Park in New yeah, York. Yeah. yeah, I know I played tennis in Central Park. There. I don't know if I ever played a basketball game. I think I played on Riverside Drive when I was in New York. I watched a little bit of the basketball at Central Park. Pretty yeah. hardcore. Huh? Where? 
I can't remember where the courts would be. But anyway. Just yeah, so bit. here we are. So uh, you and I share in common looking for a ball. We sort of said that in the first part. Um, yep. So did you grow up playing ball in Hong Kong outside or inside? <laughs> I wish I played inside. Yeah. It was outside. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how I did it, man. Yeah. Like this kind of humidity. Right, right. Hot. And we'd be playing in the middle of the day, you know, yeah. like noon time. Right. I don't know how I did it. Yeah. It's crazy hot. Yeah, so in, in we've had Ike Nwankno on this podcast. I introduced Ike to you through email, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, Ike's Basketball Academy is inside, but we went, Frank and I went to play with Ike at Chula Longcorn uh, inside as well. A lot of folks playing there. This is one of the big courts in the city, and there's another one in the park over there that you can pay to get into. So this one's free. Mm. Um, and then Benja Kitty has a basketball court we've seen, and uh, our Benja Siri, Benja Kitty, I think, has one as well. So this is one of the big courts, and I. So a lot of people who play. You can be three or four back if you come here to play. Oh wow! Yeah, and five on five. Oh wow! So this is this looks regulation full court, doesn't it, or is it a little short? It looks about right. So yeah. they play fives full court. Yeah. Oh nice. Yeah yeah. Nice. That's and a good so there'll, there'll be people waiting here. This used to not be here, and this used to be cement. And then they put the skateboard park in. So they've been fixing up this park, but it's a great place to come. So if yeah. if you're in town and you're staying at any of the um, downtown places. We're a little further away from Sukhumvit, where we normally go out and walk around where our office is at, at the Rembrandt. Um, but I think I see the Holiday right over there. Uh, and this park is great. You, you can jog in the morning. It's a little cooler in here because all yeah. the, the, I guess because all the trees. But there's all sorts of like Pilates and aerobics and stuff that are happening here too. Yeah, it seems great. Did you uh, have that in Hong Kong when they're the, the public workout, like in the, the parks? Yeah, definitely people will make a habit of the morning outdoor public park workouts. You'll uh-huh. see the, the older grandpas and grandmas or uncles and aunties yeah. out there. You'll see groups of them doing like some kind of group activity as yeah. well. So yeah, I definitely grew up seeing a lot of that. Now, one thing that I don't know if you have it here in Bangkok, but in Hong Kong, a lot of the parks would also have ping pong tables. Hmm. And they would be a stone ping pong table. <laughs> right. So the, yeah. the surface is stone, uh, not wood, yeah, yeah. which means that it affects the spin and how the ball interacts with that surface. Huh. And I mean, there are epic ping pong battles going on. Are there real nets? Uh, sometimes, people will bring nets right, right, right. to put on. Sometimes it's not, it's just come some kind of wire setup yeah, 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 yeah. that serves as a net. Um, huh. But that was big yeah. in Hong Kong. And chess, Chinese chess. Right, right, right. On a, on a cement board as well, right? Yeah, a cement board where people would bring their own little paper yeah, yeah. piece and play and you have the uncles play huh. with their little birds, their pet birds and yeah, a little, yeah. um, little cage that they would hang on the trees and enjoy the birds. That's definitely uh, Hong Kong culture right there. So Frank, Frank's a billiards guy. Oh, cool. nice. You're ping pong too, you say, right? Yeah. And you used to do that, that Prakao, the wicker ball where you it's kick? Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I think the, the landing on his wrist competed with base playing. So you know mm. how they'll jump up and kick that thing over the net? Yeah. Right, right. It's pretty intense. Yeah. Ping pong is fun. Yeah, yeah. Ping pong is fun. I enjoy it. Yeah, but this is a pretty good game here. We used to play, when I first moved here, we had a Sunday game at the U.S. Embassy, and they, they tore that court down, but that was fun. Oh, um, yeah, and now we, got, we can play at the club, right? I guess yeah. we got that here. Yeah. yeah. So do you Great play? Spot. Will you, will you uh, call next for 5-on-5 five five and go play? Out here? Yeah, public courses. I, I have, I mean, I, I want to check the grip on the floor so I don't kill myself, <laughs> but, you know, as long as... Uh, the floor is grippy enough and yeah. I feel like I can keep up. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to play, especially in the evenings when it's not that hot, right? Yeah. If we're talking middle of the day, sunshine, I'll play, but I don't know how long I can go for. <laughs> it's just hot. They got lights here too now, which is primo. That's great. Yeah, I need that because I've got vision yeah, yeah, problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gets worse at night. I think the strangest game I played in was in Makati City. Uh, oh, Philippines? Yeah, in the late 90s. No, it was, it was when that new complex was built. I played there. 
and the guy was garden had on flip flops. Oh yeah, and my did... weirdest game was in the Philippines too in Pangasinan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at like their city center, flip flops and barefoot. The guy destroyed <laughs> me. Yeah, they destroyed I mean, me too. Not hard to beat me, but he destroyed me, and it was and I was six inches taller than him too, and he was out rebounding me. It was awesome, but it's yeah. funny when you you travel around and see ball. Yeah. So you had exposure to some of the warriors, you said, over time. You got to talk with them, or no? No, I never got to okay. talk with any of them. I would, I mean, I just followed and enjoyed the yeah, team yeah, okay. during their championship runs in the Bay Area. I mean, I remember over at 500 Startups, we have like a co-working space for a lot of the portfolio companies. There were, there was one of the championship runs going on, and the. Um, the, the main gathering space they converted into like a theater uh, and they would just play the games and I mean no one was really working at that point right, when the right, games right, were going on right, like right. we were watching the game and that was always very lively uh, very fun yeah yeah that seemed like that dynasty was gonna last forever didn't it I mean I hope it can still go right but I'm, I'm skeptical as the years go by I'm increasingly skeptical but well, then you see Stephen Curry just crushing the Olympics and you think to yourself you know, if you can keep a decent squad around this man and the way that they play, and I love Steve Kerr as a coach. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think they have a chance, but I don't know, losing Clay, yeah, we could talk for a while. We'll see. It's a new season. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, when, when Durant was there, and oh. the, the, I thought this was going to this is going to be seven years straight of demolition, but interesting. So ho hopes and dreams shatter, but as a Bucks fan, I'm glad it happened to you guys. You guys uh, won a championship as a Bucks fan. That's... Yeah, boy, the the trade of Drew Holiday still has oh. me confused. Yeah, but I he's guess great. Yeah, I guess that was preventive measures, maybe. But he's that great. was a heartbreaker. And he's he, a great player. And he great played guy. great in the Olympics, right? He's a great guy and a great player. And yeah, he played great in the Olympics. You Love actually Drew. had a post that started with him on the, one of the few posts you had on your yeah, pages, but probably. Yeah, yeah, I really, really admire Drew Holiday. Uh, yeah. So you take your, you're, you're a vegan, if I can say yeah, that on, yeah, on open TV. Yeah, That's fine. And um, does that help your, your health and fitness and ability to run? Absolutely. Mm. So I went vegan when I watched the documentary called, I think, Game Changers yeah. on Netflix, where it covers Olympians and high-level athletes going vegan. Yeah, yeah. It covered some of the science behind it. I'm sure it didn't cover everything. But there was enough there to make me want to try it because... I think one of the athletes said, once I went vegan, I no longer was really sore. Huh. And at the time, I would get sore after a hard workout. I was, back then, I was of the philosophy of um, overtraining, yeah. where you train to failure and you do all these things. Now I've changed my philosophy on working out. But nonetheless, um, I decided, well, the idea of not being sore sounds fantastic. Yeah. I don't want to be sore if I don't have to be. So at the time, I was already vegetarian. It wasn't much of a stretch to go vegan. Yeah. So I went vegan, and it was true for me. I didn't really get sore. I would still get like a little sore, but not nearly like what it was before. Huh. So I got hooked. That's I thought, this is great. I could keep this going for a long time. That's such a strange thing. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. So I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the right and wrong is anymore. I, I do know that I've been a lifetime Ice, I use ice. Yeah, yeah that seems sure. to be the one thing that makes sense to me is great. keep the inflammation down. But great. Yeah, so I, I don't like playing on cement all that much, so I try to stay inside on wood. But right. uh, Lumpini Park, Bangkok, Thailand. Nemo was our guest today. A uh, lot more to discuss with this man if you can get in touch with him. But um, I think you touched the tip of the iceberg for us. But understanding marketing in this day and age in particular through the mediums that you did it uh, seems to be a uh, a dominant skill set so yeah, it's good on you and yeah it thank you it's a pleasure meeting you and it's uh, i'm glad it. you came in today yeah thanks for having me this thank, is great thank you franco thank you that's it one two three quiet <laughs>